certainly ask you to excuse me. I still got this lingering cough, so whenever I take deep breaths, I go in this coughing spell. So I ask your forgiveness up front. So I work <clears throat> at best of trying to control the coughing as much as possible. Uh, with that said, let's go to table of contents and let's look for a book entitled Matthew. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. We'll just take a look at one verse. 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Amen. You may be seated. The trail of your money leads me to where your heart resides. Jesus says, I can find where your heart is based upon where all of your activity and your money goes. That's, that's where it is. So today, um, I want to share for the next couple of weeks of talking about where your heart is. Where's your heart? Where's your heart? Where's your heart? Okay. In this um, chapter 6, there's a large portion starting with chapter 19 all the way to verse 34 that Jesus is speaking about money. And the reason he's speaking about money is because with this principle, we find ourselves being governed by it, controlled by it, manipulated by it. But unfortunately, with the love of money, it always springs forth evil. Paul writes to Timothy as he's pastoring him from a distance, and he tells him, the love of money is the root of all evil. Not money itself. Money is not evil in itself. But the love of it, the adoration for it, the allegiance to it, springs forth evil. Graves are filled with individuals now because they've chosen or been victims of the root of the love of money. There's some people who are now depressed because a lack of money. There are relationships that are strained and have ended in divorce. Number one cause in the United States, money. What can tear a friendship apart that have been together for many of years? An old debt that has not been settled. Money. What can cause you to feel great about yourself? One is a good hairstyle, and number two, when you get paid. Money always ranks in the top two. So much so that so many people have neglected to identify what their God-given reason for living is and their whole pursuit of life has been to acquire money. And that is a travesty 
for us to live life in the duration of this time in these moments whatever it may be whether it is 20 years old whether it's 60 years old whether it's 52 whatever your age may be and to discover that all of your life has been centered around you trying to acquire money there are people now all around us that are in professions not because they're skilled at it not because it is their desire to be there not because it is aligned with their purpose or even God's will some people have chose a profession they're in simply for the love of money and whenever you put money as your God you'll find yourself extremely disappointed because this little G God mammon is not loyal it's not forgiving doesn't extend grace doesn't extend mercy does not extend encouragement when you can't get in touch with it it is a very cruel master it requires allegiance but it's not reciprocating any love. And so with understanding just the basic of that, in chapter six, Jesus mentions to those who follow him, he says, when it comes to having a relationship with your creator, what even shouldn't even be on the scales is God and money. He says, you cannot serve God and money. You can't serve two masters. Either you will love the one and hate the other, or you will despise one and cling to the other one. Money pushes you to make a choice. Money never says you can have me and God at the same time. We'll share the throne. Money, the love of it, will push you to make a choice between it and God it seeks to dominate your life in practical ways let me ask you this practically speaking let's pull back from spirituality for a moment do you think every hooker enjoys her profession let's be, let's be honest and serious for a moment they don't there is not a woman that was born that played with little doll babies and played with a doll house and rode bikes and played tops or hopscotch or jump rope or double dutch or hide and seek who had aspirations that when I get older, I want to take the most valuable part of my life, of my body, and just give it away to men who stink, to men who have bad breath to men who have no hygiene, to men who have a disease, who men who may, stro sh may strangle and choke me or even possibly kill me for 40, bucks, for 40 bucks. Do you think that that was their desire? For the young lady who walks into a nightclub and speaks to the bar manager and says, listen, is there a position for me to be a stripper? What you got? Do you think her aspirations was to slide a banana pole and to take her clothes off for a bunch of strangers and not hand her money, but to ball it up and throw it at her like she's a trash can. Do you think it's her desire at the end of the night, smelling with Old Spice, Eternity, CK1, Invictus, all these different colognes all over her body and to spend her night unrolling ones and laying them on our ironing board to straighten them out just so that she can have a little bit of dignity when she go to make the bank deposit to pay her bills. Do you think that is her desire? Money will cause you to walk away from ethics and character. This is why we can't look down on people. Some of you in your own house with your own relatives, when you come out of the shower, you cover it up with a towel. 
how much more harder it is to do that to strangers. That's not their desire. They don't do it because that was their passion. They don't do it because that's their calling. It's the love of money that eats away and rots at the human soul. Do you think every doctor that you have seen in urgent care and the emergency room wanted to be a doctor? You can tell by some of the dispositions. They don't want to be there no more than you do. If you get a doctor to spend more than nine minutes with you, you win it. You spent more time with a nurse than you did a physician. Many of them don't like their jobs. Within the top five professions of alcoholism, lawyers, doctors, highest, highest paid professions. And we push our children to not pursue purpose, not pursue what God has created them to do, but no, go to school, get a good job so that you can be a lawyer or a doctor. At an early age, we teach people, steer your heart towards money, not God. We don't steer our children, and some of us haven't even been steered, for our hearts to be directed towards God. It's gotten to a place in this culture that if children don't want to go to church, you ain't got to. But you got to go to school, and you will be at school on time. You can say, I don't feel like going to school, but you're going. You can complain all the way to the bus stop, but you're going. You can tell me how much you don't like your teacher, but you're going to be in that home room. You can tell us what you don't like about your science teacher and your math teacher, but you're going to sit right in that class and you're going to learn. But when it comes to the one thing that really matters most, the God of the universe, the one that will sustain them for the entirety of their life. Oh, you got an option. You don't have to if you don't want to. You don't need to learn how to handle tough situations when you find yourself in the pit of life. You don't need to worry about that. Well, I want you to get a good education so you can make you some good money. I don't want you to learn how to deal with stress and frustration and depression and how to deal with demons and how to deal with demonic influence and how to deal with highs and lows, mountains and valleys of life. I just want you to get a good education so you can make you some good money and get up out of, up out of here. And so we've been raising and perpetuating a culture where your heart is cultivated to want money. And many people have made a choice that I want God, but when money calls me, that's the one I bow down to. If you have to choose between God and money, you ask someone intellectually, they'll say, oh, that's an easy one. I'll choose God every day. But I'm going to walk you through over the next couple of weeks how we in subtle ways have made choices to choose money over God. I, too, myself have been guilty of it. I've chosen money at times over God. Where God becomes secondary and I'll justify it by saying, well, he understands. He know I got to eat. Yeah, he knows that. That's the part he said he going to cover. Yeah. <coughs> so let's write these three things down. One, in the next three weeks, I'm going to share with you, we'll talk about next week, the basis of giving. Two, we'll talk about the, the week following that we'll talk about the barriers to giving. And then lastly, we'll close with the blessings of giving. But today I want us to zero in on the seat of our soul, which is our heart. That's the part that Solomon says we ought to give attention to. Solomon says in Proverbs 4.23, 4.23, Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your heart 
with all diligence. Protect, guard. Be on alert in guarding your heart with all diligence, for out of it flows the issues of life. You need to guard your heart. You need to protect your heart. You need to be watchful of the condition and the complexion of your heart. And the reason being is because out of your heart, out of the outpour of what's in it, will flow the issues of life. Jesus says, if I want to figure out where your heart is, I just follow the money trail. Because there's an inseparable link between your heart and the money that you've acquired and how you spend it. Because what, what is priority to you is determined by how you spend your money. This investigation of our current president is not just the collusion. They're not just trying to figure out whether or not he conspired with the Russians. You know what they spend an enormous amount of time doing behind the scenes? They're looking at the trail of money. Where he got it from and how has he spent it? How has he directed it? They're following the money trail. You can tell if we looked, did a forensic test of your checking account, we can tell what is priority to you. Some may say, well, the reason you keep saying these shoe stores on there is because every now and then my feet swell and I have to buy new shoes. I have to have the new Jimmy Choo's because the Jimmy Choo's have the ability to extend. The leather can spread when my foot fills with fluid and it's very comfortable on my ankles. Jimmy Choo's, right? You can tell where a person's priority, where their heart is when you see Amex or MasterCard or Visa charges all along there. You can tell. And the debt that is acquired over our lives is a subtle trick of the enemy to cause a free person to be in slavery. Debt is acquired when a person has not reigned in their heart, when they want self-gratification now. Debt is centered around as a clever way to appease your self-gratification, but also to bring you under subjection to it. When I acquire debt, I find myself wanting something that I have not earned. Debt is a result of me asking and borrowing from my future to give me self-gratification right now of which I have not earned. And I am willing to take moments, hours, and money from my future in exchange for this brief moment of self-gratification and to be entangled under your terms and if you give it to me now in exchange I am willing to give you more as a promise more than what it's worth just so I can have it now now intellectually you would say to yourself that don't make sense but this is what we do all the time and our culture has played upon our need for self gratification and a lack of self control in our heart and I am willing to pay more for something than what it's worth over an extended period of time. And to keep you in grips, we'll come up with s slick and clever ways of refinancing or consolidating. Making us think that if we can just have all of these debts placed under one master, then we can manage it better. All we did is just move five or six or four or three or two of them into one large master, of which I'm still under a burden where I am to owe somebody and I'm paying on something more than what it is worth. And they are benefiting on my inability to bring my heart under subjection. 
right? <coughs> the biggest issue that we have with our heart is that we're not surrendering it to Christ. We're not surrendering it to the kingdom. We want this exchange with God where whatever it is that you have for us, I want it now. I don't even want patience. I want it now. I want it now. And I'm doing whatever it takes that whatever you have for me in the future, I will do what it takes to, to elevate or to accelerate that process that I'm obtaining it right now in my today. So that if I have to work overtime, I will do it so that I can get, if I have to sacrifice some ethics to acquire it, I'll do it. Even if it's just temporary, I'll do it. And the challenge with this is the more that I do that is the more that I move away from God. And we never really seen a link between my money and my heart. But Jesus is painting the picture here. Your money's attached to your priorities. And when it comes to priorities, your priorities should be based in the kingdom. The reason that I created you for a kingdom moment, a kingdom purpose. I created you for something very specific, not to be entangled in the world system and let them dictate to you what you should have. Because every year, they'll shift gears and they'll tell you what you should want. They'll tell you, this is the new car that you should have. Yes, it is a Mercedes-Benz 2018, but guess what? I'm coming out with a new version of the same class in 2019. Same make and model, but I just added a few things on the dashboard. And even if you fell in love with the 2019, guess what? In 2019, they're going to come out with a, each year they're telling you what you should like and what you should love. Styles have changed, not because of our taste, but for the need to put something before you to, to entice you yes, to bring you in, yes, to shift your priorities. The holidays that exist in this country in this culture, it's not centered around meaningful observations, not meaningful moments of reflection, no matter what the holiday is. Martin Luther King Day. What is that centered around? We just look at it as a day off. Valentine's Day. What is that day centered around? We think love. The day was set aside to honor St. Valentine, a bishop that was killed. Had nothing to do with fat little cupids. It had nothing to do with little fat little angels. It had nothing to do with that. But we can turn it and commercialize it and get them to release their money. It's about a man who died. Clergy who was killed. Bishop Valentine. Like, I didn't even know he was a bishop. St. Patty's Day. Are we all Irish? <laughs> maybe in your genealogy, if you do that DNA thing, maybe somewhere in there you may find a little bit of percentage of, of Ireland in you. But the majority of us are Wakandans. But interesting enough, we'll buy something green and pinch people at work. You ain't got your green on. You ain't got your green on. Commercialize it. Memorial Day. It's a good time for us to get some barbecue. Not memorializing those who serve this country. Next one. Fourth of July. Independence Day. We celebrate it, but it ain't for us. Next one, Labor Day. There's more unemployed people celebrating Labor Day than the ones who work. The irony in that. Halloween. The celebration of the dead. Evil and demonic spirits. Witches and warlocks. Thanksgiving. We celebrate the day when the Europeans came over 
and traded with the Native Americans, tricked them, murdered them, raped them, and annihilated thousands upon thousands of Native Americans. And they celebrated by having a feast and saying, look at what the Lord has done. He allowed us to invade this new land and kill all the inhabitants. We tricked them in making them think that they could give us some stuff and we'll give them something in exchange and we murdered them. And we'll sit around the table, commercialize it. Christmas. The number one season when depression spikes. Why are we, why is it spiking in our culture? It's because we're not having an outlet to be able to really honor the one who was born. I'm depressed because I didn't get an opportunity to really celebrate Jesus' birth. I'm depressed. Because I don't have enough money to buy most stuff. Am I depressed thinking about the nativity scene? Am I, am I depressed thinking about how Jesus as an infant, newborn, laid in a trough, a feeding trough for cattle. Full of mucus and boogers and smell and saliva. They laid him in a manger on top of hay. Was I depressed about that? Was I depressed because Rudolph was not picked with his red nose? What am I really depressed and sad about on Christmas? We feel this anxiety because we feel like I can't buy enough stuff. We've been driven by the world system. And unfortunately, it has dictated our life. So much so that we're willing to compromise biblical principles for self-gratification. And we have come up with clever ways to justify our selfishness and our self-centeredness. So let me go further. When it comes to giving, a part of our growth in being a disciple is attached to our ability to share and to give. It is a biblical commandment. It's not optional. It's not optional, believers. It's not optional, believers. Though you treat it as an option. It is not an option, believers. It is as important as it is forgiveness. It is as important as being kind. It is important as not lying. It is important as just not killing someone. Giving is a commandment. And the first thing that God establishes in the Old Testament is that everything that you have and have access to, it's not yours. It belongs to me. Your responsibility is to manage what's mine. And as I am giving you responsibility to manage what's mine, a part of what you have is holy. There is a portion of what you possess that is holy. The Bible says that the tithe is holy unto the Lord. And that part, take your hands off and you manage the rest effectively in accordance to kingdom agenda. You manage the rest in accordance to kingdom agenda, not personal self-gratification. As a result, we flip it. So the first example of tithing is found in Genesis 14. Genesis 14, Abraham gives to a high priest whose name is Melchizedek, king of Salem. He gives him a tenth. He presents the tenth. That's the first introduction to tithing. Then you see it again with his son Jacob doing the same thing in chapter 28. You see it also in Deuteronomy. You also see it in Leviticus. You also see it re-mentioned again in Numbers that God is pushing the point that a tenth belongs to me. Set that aside for kingdom purposes. Now, I'll go more in depth about it next week, but this is a few basic things that I want to share with you about tithing. Tithe represents a tenth, a tenth, a tenth. It's 10%. Tithe means a tenth. A tithe is not. It's a tenth of what you possess. It's a tenth of what you possess. 
It is not you don't possess time. It is extended to you. You don't tithe time. There is, no biblical, there is no biblical reference for you tithing time. So for, for individuals who believe that I don't have to give God what already belongs to him, I don't need to set that aside as he's instructed, I'll give him some moments of my life. I'm going to tithe my time. And again, I have entertained that idea for conversation's sake with people. So then if you're going to do that, if you do that, then 16.8 hours out of the week needs to be devoted to God. Are you giving? Let's suppose if you want to, if you want to justify your actions of not taking your hands off what already belongs to him that is already set aside, set aside as being holy. If you say, I tithe my time, do you give God 16.8 hours per week? Even the people that come to church on a regular consistent basis, that still doesn't equate to 16.8 hours. It doesn't. So even if you come on Sunday, that's two. Right? Knock that down to what? 14. You good with math? Watch the math. Sunday, right? Two hours. Let's suppose we come for Monday, let's say for men's or women's group. Let's round it off two hours. If you're on the praise team, or the worship team, or a musician, you got rehearsal on Tuesday, let's give it another two and a half. Let's make it three. Let's be generous. Let's make it three hours. Let's say they in here from seven to ten. Let's make it generous, right? Let's suppose, let's suppose if they're on a praise team, if they feel like coming to Bible study the next day for an hour and 15 minutes, that's if, right? Let's suppose they're feeling in a good mood and they're feeling like this week I'm in love with God. Let's suppose they come to rehearsal, I mean to, to Bible study. Let's add on a, let's make it, no, don't even do an hour. Let's say I did Bible study from 7 to 9. I typically don't have anything on a Thursday. Rarely do we have anything on a Friday. And we might once a blue moon, do something on a Saturday. I try to respect people's personal time. So how many hours is that? That's just seven hours? I'm short seven out of 16. Well, they say they may say, well, I have been giving God my time when I'm at home. Like I've been praying and reading and when I'm at home, I've been like being real generous and stuff. When I'm at work, I'm doing like evangelism on my lunch break or like when I'm out and about, I may be doing kingdom work. How much of your personal time, that seven hours, can you really account for doing kingdom work? And, if, and, and again, let me say this. If you're going to entertain time, the tithe is literally the minimum. The immature believer would look at it as it's the max. That's the minimum. That is the smallest thing that God has asked his disciples to do. That's the smallest thing. And we treat it like that's the mountaintop. That's the apex. That's like the heavenly thing to do that. That's the, that's the bare minimum. I would choose tithing every day, every moment over forgiveness. I would choose loving. <laughs> Let's understand this concept. Biblically, we are to love who? God, with what? All of our heart. Here we go, the heart thing again. All of our heart, all of our soul, and all of everything within us, right? Then he wants me to love my neighbor. But he don't stop there. Not just the people you cool with and not just your neighbor, but he also told me to love who? My enemies. Now, I would choose taking temper. If I had to choose between a 10%... And loving my enemy. It is much easier for me to give him, break him off 10%, than a, to than not like your enemy, not speak to, you don't even speak to your enemies. You're not cordial to your enemies. You're not friendly to your enemies. You're not sociable with your enemies, but the command is to love them. You think tithing is hard? I ain't cough yet. I'm, I got my voice now. Here we go. <laughs> you think that is hard? You think, you think, now, I was wondering, I was getting ready to ask you to raise your hand. In your mind, in your mind, raise your hand. If you think a 10% 10, 10 of what you already have is hard, in your mind, raise your hand. Okay? Let me tell you something. 10% is not hard for you. It's a heart issue. Let me tell you why. If 
If you work in Maryland, let's say you live there, your income tax is based upon a bracket. So you might be taxed, uh, you do taxes, what is it in Maryland? Depend on your bracket. What is it? Oh man, that's if you're making over four hundred thousand dollars a year. Well, that's yeah, that's that's you. He thirty-seven percent. Hey man, we need to be hanging around these two when it's time to go to dinner, right? <laughs> Seventeen to twenty-one percent. All right. So federal is like ten percent, twelve percent, twenty-two, twenty-four, thirty-two, thirty-five, and thirty-seven, depending on the bracket of what your income is. That's federal. Then you also got to do state. Like if you live in Maryland, you got to do state. You got to pay off your income. State, which could be anywhere, if you're long there, like 2% up to 5% of what you make. All right? So let's, let's go in the middle. Now, let's be conservative, Alondria. Let's not even go like on Georgia's salary. Let's kind of go like on mine. Let's do like, let's do 10%. Let's suppose federal was saying, you give me 10%, of which they're not, they're hitting us harder than that. But let's suppose it's, it's 10%. That's federal. Then the state gonna say, then I need anywhere between two percent. If I let's just let's go on the minimum. Let's say two 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 percent. So that's twelve. So I'm getting taxed for what I make, twelve percent, right? Let me show you how you pay more than twelve. Okay. How many of you got a cell phone? Almost everybody. Do you know when you pay your monthly bill, you're still paying taxes on that? You know what that tax is? Five percent. All right? Catch the math. All right? How many of you got a car? You know, the insurance is not tax-free. You're paying, you're paying taxes on your car insurance. If you're putting the gas in the car, although it may be like 265, 275, 274, depending on where you go, and if it's a Thursday, you can get 5% off, 5% off per gallon, right? You're still paying taxes on that five more percent. Let's suppose from leaving the gas station, I want to go to the grocery store. Or let's say I want to run to 7-Eleven. And if I go to 7-Eleven, I want to get like some soda pop, right? Or a donut. Or if I want to get a big gulp or a bigger Slurpee. That's okay. Even if it's a dollar purchase, I still got to pay 5%. But let's suppose I cross over into D.C. And I go to D.C. and I buy something in D.C. Do you know what the tax percentage is there now in D.C.? If I'm going to a restaurant or a food restaurant or a carryout, you see those a lot of those in Southeast. If I go to the carryout, Johnny's or Eddie Leonard's, what do you think the carryout is going to be? 10%. Can we keep going? So and let's suppose I go... Uh, Let's suppose I go to Macy's. It's around Christmas time. Black Friday sale. I can get a good sale. I can get something like 50% off. But even when I go to the cashier, they're still going to charge me five more percent if I'm in Maryland. So it depends on what state I'm in. Maybe hit me hard if I'm in Virginia. But nevertheless, with every, every time it's required for me to even touch my money, there's a percentage that they're saying, I already asked you for your tithe on the front end. But every time you touch your money, I'm taking a percentage off. Every time you touch it. Every time it moves, I want some of it. And you know what? I've never seen nobody in Nordstrom's or Macy's or Walmart argue with the cash. I have already paid the state tax when, they got my, when I got my paycheck. They already took state tax. I don't see nobody arguing about another state tax that's getting ready to be taken out again. They, they got it on the front end, but every time you go to the cash register, they're hitting it again. And there is no, there is, notice, there is no complaints. There is no issues. The real issue, you, and you, don't, you don't have a problem giving the world system what they say is theirs. You work for it, but they say it's theirs. But when it comes to taking your hands off what God says is his, that's problematic. Look how many percentages have been hit from the one paycheck you got. From the one paycheck you got. Now you're going to think about it every time you go buy a stick of gum, whether you go into McDonald's, whether you go into Wendy's real quick, whether you go to the carryout, whether you go to Walmart, whether you go to Sam's Club, Costco, BJ's, Restaurant Depot, wherever you may go, you're going to remember every time I touch this debit card, they hitting a percentage. You know what? I ain't have a problem with that before. But even if you go to the restaurant and you sit down and eat, it's in D.C., 10%. What is the standard percentage that you should give to your server? After you don't pay taxes for your meal, there's still an expectation that you need to be able to bless 
the one that served. Now, here's people who have a problem paying preachers. All right, so you go to a restaurant and a person brings you your food. Now, they didn't cook it. They're just bringing it from the kitchen to the table. From the kitchen to the table. They didn't cook it. They're just moving it from there to there. They didn't cook it. They're moving it from there to there. And you judge based upon whether or not you're going to give them a tip, whether or not they were asking you, do you want some more to drink? Would you like some more hot tea? Would you want some more coffee? Well, is your food hot or for your food cold? And you base your tip of what you're going to bless them with based upon their level of service from moving it from there to there. The standard is now 15 to 20% of what? Whatever that total was. So if my bill came up to with a whole group of people, or if I had a date and the bill came up to $100, then I need to be able to tip anywhere from $15 to $20. If a server gets that, that's more than what some of y'all gave me. But, but, no one ever says that the server is doing this to make money. No one ever says, that waitress only brought me my food. They only just trying to make money. They, they probably stealing all the money in this all of God. They in this for the money. And to ensure, now, that, that's just if you got a party of four or less. If you in a large group, they will put it in the bill so that you don't walk out after being served by the person who's labored for you, they will put it in the bill. This gratuity is now a part of the bill. Now, we got a group of more than four or five of you guys in here. Now, if I said there ought to be some gratuity before you hit that door, y'all be having a fit. Does anybody complain? Say, I need the manager. I am not paying this gratuity for a party of six or more. How many party? It's 12 of us, but we ain't paying that. Then nobody gonna do that. How much you got? How much you got? How much you got? We need to split this tip. Mm -mm, we're splitting this tip. Don't do that. It's the mindset, and the mindset is triggered by the disposition of your heart. We don't have a we don't have a problem with percentages. Yeah. Hear me. We don't have a problem with percentages. So I said all of that to say the issue of tithe has nothing to do with money. It has all to do with the disposition of your heart. Amen. Because if they say it. Hear me, if they say it on Black Friday at Macy's, Bloomingdale's, Saks, wherever you, whatever your, your choice venue is, if they say it on Black Friday, 10% off. How many, how many of you getting up at 4 o'clock for 10%? What would you say regarding that 10%? It's a 10% sale. Girl, you better get up there. It's 10% off on everything. What would you say, Honestly. You go for 10%? No, I said that's Why, what? Huh? What did you say? That ain't nothing. Everybody in here, most people were saying, that 10%, that ain't nothing. But then, but then, but then, but then, but then is not a good word, but you understand what I'm saying. But then, on Sunday, that 10% is monumental. It moves from not being nothing then it's like a mountain. When it's something that you want to buy, 10%, that's a mohill. That ain't nothing. Basically. You paying it twice. But I want you to see, throughout Scripture, in Old Testament, even in the New Testament, what God consistently pushes is that giving has nothing to do with money. It's your heart. It's your heart. When your heart is right, you don't care about the amount. You don't care about the amount. You can have an established budget for a birthday or even Christmas. What hurts you is not so much that you only have, let's say, $200 in your account to buy something is that what you wanted to get them exceeds that cost. What hurts you is I wanted to give them more. I wanted to give them more. More. Because I, because I want to show them in a tangible way what the complexion of my heart is towards them. And the great thing 
about tithing is this is why God has never, nowhere in Scripture has he ever said at any disposition, dispensation of time, whether it's in the Old Testament or New Testament, he never says, give me 10 shekels of silver or 12 denarii. He's never, nowhere does he ever say that specific amount. What he said is, the tithe is holy. You present that back to God. Take your hands off of that. And the great news is, it's, it's so dynamic that in principle, everybody can participate in it. So if a person is a millionaire and gives a tithe, the person who only makes $10 a week that tithes is the same as a person who is a millionaire in the sight of God. Because principally, they both responded to the same thing. And so it's not that God would look at it and say, the millionaire gave more. In our eyes, we will quantify numerically that that is more. But in the eyes of God, it is the same. It is equal. That's the brilliance. That's the brilliance of the kingdom is that it's not on a monetary number. It's a percentage of what you giving. You're saying that, listen, this belongs to you anyway. And I'm taking my hands off what is already yours. It's already yours. It's already yours. So what is, what is interesting is that we look at it from a dollars and cents when it's really about the heartbeat of your soul. And the justification at times is, I can't afford it. When in reality, that tenth of the 100 that you have is not the line of demarcation between you being put out or being homeless and being destitute. Most of the time that 10% is already spent on something frivolous. Honestly, it is. Honestly, it is. Typically, it is. We'll spend something very easily. I mean, and I've said even using before, I've, I've, I've had people say, who are no longer here to say, well, listen, I will give. I just, I can't afford it right now. It's just tight. And then after service, hey, let's go out to dinner, Pastor. My treat. Now, I can't get you to do that because my wife will be there and my kid. No, I'll cover all y'all. Man, that'll be over $50. I got you. I'm like, did you just say it? The other day, you couldn't afford it. Like, I don't be forgetting. I just don't bring it. I ain't throwing it in your face. But what, if it's something you want to do, you just get a, they don't look at that as spending money. They fit that, that's a necessity. I got to eat. I got to eat. So when we go to Cheesecake Factory, Pastor, that's, that's on me. I got you. They don't look at that as I'm spending money. They don't count that. It's what it is. But it's about your, it's about your heart. So Jesus pushes in that same chapter. If you're going to have a priority, listen, God already knows what you, what you want to wear, what you need to eat, and where you need to lay your head. He's clear about all those things. And he says, I'll provide that. I'll make sure you have all of those things that you need when the kingdom becomes priority. And right now, I'm not priority. I'm not priority. And there are repercussions to not putting God as priority. There is. And most of the time, we've heard Malachi 3, 6, quoted 50 million different ways and stated, is, that's almost kind of like the go-to scripture for tithing. And most people will say to compel people to give that if you give, God will open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing and have room enough to receive. But if you don't, you're cursed with a curse, which is true. They ain't make it up. That's what he said. But the implication is there that whatever you were looking for, what he said to the people of Israel then who were living off of their crops, I'll make sure there ain't nothing being produced. If you are depending on your crops to produce, and then you think you're going to take the seeds from that and then re-sow it so you can have another harvest, I'll impact that harvest. I'll get what's mine. And he does it every time. So for the person who does not tithe, he gets it. He just don't get it through the doors of New Direction. It goes to Michelin. It goes to Goodyear. He goes to the electrician that all of a sudden just something broke. I mean, he'll get it. Here's the thing. And we can look at it next week. God tax on interest. Just like, what do you think the principal income, to, the federal government, the IRS got the principle of that if you don't pay them what is theirs, they charge interest. That's a biblical principle. They've adopted that from the Bible. So when you don't pay your income tax and they charge you interest, 
for what you did not give that was owed to them, they got that straight out of the Bible. That's a biblical principle. The world has adopted our own principles and they're working it in their favor. And you're going to pay them. Because we fear them more than we fear God, who is a sustainer of our lives. But he'll get it. Trust me. Whether it's through your automobile, through a leaky roof. So sometimes it's better to just go ahead and pay that $100 or $120 or $200, whatever it is, to pay, rather than pay for that $4,000 for your roof to be replaced. Amen. Yeah. And let me just say this because I'm on a tie roll. I ain't coughed yet, so I'm ready. Here we go. Let me just say this and then I'm going to stop. Um, the purpose of tithe is this, because some people are unclear. The purpose of the tithe was so that, that the tent of meeting or the gathering place that they come together, they would have enough to sustain those who were widows and orphans or those who were in need or those who were financially struggling. But it was also designed to take care of the priest. It was to sustain the priest, the leader, but it was also to take care of those who had a sincere need. If people don't give, then it's hard to meet the needs of those who are around you who are struggling. And that's the kingdom agenda, so that everybody who's in the kingdom didn't have to go without. That we set aside what God gave us to use it to advance God's kingdom. But if everyone doesn't do it, but now typically in our culture, what is different from what it was in the Bible days, they didn't have to pay rent. They didn't have a light bill back then. They didn't have a water bill. They didn't have a gas bill. So certain expenses, they could just use everything that they had to ensure that everybody in that gathering didn't go hungry. Everybody there could be taken care of. Everybody was blessed. Nobody would be in debt anymore. And if we had something and there was a debt over their life, we would release them from the debt based upon what was stored up that we have. So that nobody is a slave to anybody but God. That was the original purpose. But in a gathering of individuals, you typically have about 15, anywhere from 10 to 15 people sustaining the whole church. While the other 80 to 85 are consumers and leeches. The people who require most out of me are not the people who give. It's the people who don't give a dime. The people who have asked me for money from this church are the people who don't really give. God forbid, if I say no, they get upset. They see the church don't be doing that, and they don't contribute. It's a consumer mentality. It's the disposition of your heart. You don't want to give anything to the kingdom, but you want everything from it. And that's the same disposition of how they come to Christ. It's the same disposition that you come to Christ. It's a heart issue. It's not about the money. We just haven't been taught what it says. That's why Jesus says, when it comes to this money, I don't want that stuff being attached to you. You're going to flow with me, sell everything that you got, and let's start all over. And let me show you I can take care of you. Let me show you I can take care of you. That's why if you roll with me, no matter where we go, we're going to eat. Disciples never went hungry. They left their jobs. I feel convicted now. Yo, I just got convicted. They never went hungry. Hear me. They never went hungry. If we show up, all somebody got to have is two fish. I'll feed everybody who showed up with me. We can go to a wedding reception. They ain't got nothing more to drink. Bring me some water. I'll fix that real quick. He'll meet every need. He'll meet every need. You get sick, you don't need health care insurance. I got you. That's it. I don't have health care insurance. I'm going to get sick and die. Well, he's, he specializes in raising people from the dead, y'all. Seriously. What are we worried about? All right, all his power. 